Uh, I'm grateful. Some of you seem awake asleep already. Let's try it again. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Ah, that's good. That's good. So grateful you're here today. So grateful that we can worship together uh, this morning. And so much to be thankful for. So much to sing to our great God for today. Um, in our video, I love that video um, of two of our church planners that we support. Um, uh, they're in Colorado, doing a great work in Colorado, letting other people know about King Jesus. And coming up in two weeks, we're going to have our Great Commission Giving Offering. It's our offering that 100% of that goes to support missionaries and mission causes. A vast percentage of that will go to overseas, supporting our over 4,000 missionaries um, that are taking the gospel to places that have never heard the name of Jesus. Um, a, a large percentage of that will be go uh, in North America to support um, the North American Mission Board. and the NA, it, it really uh, goes support North American Mission Board and support missionaries like you saw in that video. And it helps also helps support our two church plants. Uh, the one in St. Louis and one in Indianapolis. And I want to encourage you to be praying about how God could use you to give to help others come to know uh, the name of, of Jesus. Uh, th the video asked a good question. Are the sacrifices that we make it worth the souls of others? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. It is worth it to pray. It is worth it to give. It is worth it to go so that other people can know Jesus and spend eternity with Christ in heaven. So let me ask you to be praying seriously about how God might move in your heart. Hopefully you received a bulletin today, and let me draw your attention just to a few things. Um, coming up on Saturday is our, a women's event, Coffee and Jesus. Uh, sounds pretty good. Uh, uh, it's at the Buzz Cafe here at the Benton Square from 9 to 1030. And so women, uh, it'd be a great time to connect with others and be encouraged in your faith and sign up at Sign Up Central uh, for that. Also, coming up in two weeks, is a, we are throwing a Christmas party at Heritage Woods. Lots of different things that we'll be doing. And so if you love to help out with that, that should be a fantastic Saturday evening. Just sign up at Sign Up Central. It'll be a great way to live love to other individuals. And then those in 5th and 6th grade, there's a 5th and 6th grade lock-in just uh, two weeks away. I know you don't want to miss that. I know my little girl doesn't want to miss that. So you can sign up for that as well at Sign Up Central too. And uh, I just wanted you to know that uh, on Monday... Um, your Helping Hands ministry got to give out 40 Thanksgiving baskets to 40 different families. And I really appreciate uh, 41. Let me get that right. Excuse me with that. Where, I, hear, I hear voices all around. There's the voice, okay. And a walk-in. Sweet. So we helped out 41 different families. Thank you, Paula, with that. That is fantastic. I appreciate the ways that you love on others in the community. In front of you in your, in your pew is a connection card. If you're new here, we love for you to fill that out so we can have just a record of you being with us today. If there is something you'd like for a pastor to follow up with, feel free to check something. We'll love to chat with you. And if you've got a prayer request, feel free to put those on the back. Uh, we take very seriously praying over each of those as a staff every Monday. So we'd love to have your prayer needs so we can pray for you. Well, uh, my friends, it's grateful to have Pastor John. We're glad you got to have some vacation. Yes. But we're glad to have you back and lead yes. us in worship. So we, will you lead us, my friend? I will do it. Great. Good to be here. We need to realize our total dependence upon God. You just try stepping out on your own without Him. See how far you get. Why don't you stand with me? We cannot make it on our own. Let's sing those great words. We cannot make it on our own. Oh God, we need the cross and the Savior.
house this morning to worship you in song through your scripture this morning and through prayer and I want to thank you for all the blessings that you've given us especially this past week as we've been reflecting over how we've been blessed and we're thankful to you father for being our creator and through your son Jesus being our savior so we thank you so much for that I want to lift up all those who may be traveling uh, because of the holiday this week keep them safe and those who are maybe sick or going through some type of suffering, Lord, that uh, your spirit will just comfort them and give them strength and courage during this time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us clean hands. today there are folks around you would you greet them in the name of Jesus this morning Sing with us. We are the church, a chosen generation called to be a royal priesthood, called to be a holy nation. We'll take the message of salvation all across the earth. We've been called out. We are the church. We are crucified with Would you please be seated? 
said a while ago, we need help. And I'm glad that we've got help. Amy's going to do the solo as we sing about the chain breaker. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, you've been hearing the same old voice till the same old lie. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves one out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. But there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. I said, you need to lean on some of those words. If you need freedom or do you need saving, what do you need today? He can suffice for all of your needs. I'm thankful that before God's throne, we have an advocate. Let's stand and sing about him. Please, 
on your behalf. Your name. has taken our sin upon himself. That song said, and it's absolutely true, that God the just looks on him and pardons me. My sinful soul counted free. I love a God that not only made the plan of salvation, but executed it upon himself so that he became the penalty for our sins. That takes strength, my friends, and he can do whatever you need in your life today. is all of this. Father to the Father
Dearly Father, thank you for today. Thank you, dear Lord, for who you are, dear Father. Such a loving God. To love someone like me, dear Lord, I just thank you for forgiving me for all of our sins. Dear Lord, I just pray that you be with today and that you touch each and every one of us' as hearts that's here, Tony Father. We can't walk closer to you, dear Lord. And if we don't know you, dear Lord, I pray that we've come to know you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, be with Sammy. Give him the words to speak, dear Lord. We know you're with him, dear Lord. We're just thankful for him, dear Lord. Pray that you'll bless this offering. Help us to use it the way you'd have us to use it. it might further your kingdom, dear Lord. And once again, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Children's Church may go. You are my joy. You are my song. You are the well, the one I'm drawing from. You are my refuge, my whole life long. Where else could I go? Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me. Day after day, night after night, I will. Continue on Sundays, uh, walking through the book of Luke, looking at a series called Pursuing Jesus. And as we pursue Jesus, we recognize that uh, there are things that try to trip us. There are things that tempt us. There are things that entice us to not pursue Jesus, to not, to not live for him, to not seek him with all that is within us. And, and um, some of those are temptations. They're, they're real. 
Uh, we, we sang a song, Chain Breaker. Uh, many of us, uh, we, we come into this service today with chains, addictions, hang-ups, habits that, that we need the Lord to break. We need the Lord to, to guide us uh, in our life. And one of the things that why I enjoy preaching at jail so often is uh, those in jail, they, they know they've messed up. Uh, they, they know they have issues. They know that they need to change. They just don't really know how to do it. They, they keep going back to the same thing, but, but they recognize that there is a need there. But I wonder sometimes if we genuinely understand that we need God to help us with our needs too. So we talk about temptations. Um, one of the many temptations that, that I face has to do with my my stinking cell phone. That cell phone is supposed to make life easier. It's supposed to make me smarter. It's supposed to help me remember more. But the only thing that that cell phone does is it just sucks up more and more of my own time. Now, I know it's a time waster. I'm not looking at anything inappropriate. I'm looking at sports. Georgia won, by the way, if you didn't know. I, I, I'm looking at other stuff. I mean, I'm looking and seeing what you post on social media, how many turkeys you ate. And it just, I'll just five minutes, four, I know five minutes turns to 10, turns into 25 minutes. And then I feel like, man, I've just wasted. I feel drained. I've been a bad steward of the precious time that I have. And I'll tell myself, all right, tomorrow I'm going to do better. And then tomorrow that phone starts singing out my name, Sammy. Don't you want to see what's going on today? Just five minutes, just five minutes. I'll touch it again. Five turns to 10, 10 turns to 25, and I've wasted another some more. And that phone seems to be a horrible temptation for me. Nothing necessarily wrong with the phone. It's just that it leads me to be a bad steward of my time. I share that with you because what temptations do you face? We all face temptations. Now, temptations are different than trials. Trials come from the Lord. When God sends a trial your way, it's to help purify your faith, develop your faith. Uh, I'm not thankful often for the trials, but I'm thankful for how God works in the trials. Temptations are different. They're not from the Lord. They're an enticement to sin. It's a distraction away from God. It, it, is, it, it, is, it is leading us into Satan's path. And what are the temptations that you're facing today? I want to pray for you, okay? Let's, let me pray. God, I pray, Lord, as we look at your word today, God, that you would help us, Lord, to honestly understand where Satan is attacking, and they will honestly know and recognize the temptations that we're in. And God, will you give us strength? As we've sung today, will you break chains? Will you defend us? Will you give us strength to honor you? Help us, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your copy of God's word, we open it with me to Luke chapter 4. Verse 1, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, we continue to look at, at the life of Jesus, continue to look at who Jesus is and what it means to pursue Jesus. And so today we're looking at per, pursuing victory over temptations, pursuing victory over temptations. And we look today at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. God's word says this, then Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all this will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from there. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. And they will support you with their hands. And they, and they will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. We come to our text this morning. Uh, the Jesus is about 30 years old. This happens right after Jesus' baptism. 
Uh, Jesus is starting his ministry, starting his course for his life. He's living in obedience to God's plan. He, he, is, he is fulfilling God's assignment for him. So he's, he is marching, in a sense, already to the cross, to die on the cross for our sins. And we see the Spirit on Jesus' ministry. It was the Spirit that lit on Jesus when he was baptized. Um, the Spirit anointed Jesus to do the ministry, the calling that God has for him. And the Spirit here, as we begin our text in verse 1, the Spirit now, Jesus is, is in Jesus, and it is leading him into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness, um, the Judean wilderness, is thought as of Satan's backyard. Um, it is a place of wild animals. Uh, it is also thought of the place of demons. And so what Jesus is doing as, as the Spirit is a driving force in his life, as Jesus is following the Spirit's leading, he is going on the offensive, going into Satan's backyard. And as he goes, uh, he is fasting. He has nothing to eat for 40 days. Now, we've seen that 40-day fast already in Moses already in Elijah, and now we see it in Jesus. Fasting is a great thing. It helps us often uh, when we fast. Um, we are doing so, a great spiritual discipline, because we want to be in tune with the God and get serious about God's business. And so we, we take away food or other things because we want to devote more attention and more of our life to the Lord. And so Jesus is serious about God's business. So he's been fasting in Satan's backyard for 40 days, and the Bible says he was hungry. I want to present to you um, at about 11.30 every day, I get hungry. Are you with me? Jesus was not, he did not already eat Frosted Flakes at 6 a.m. and it was 11.30 and he was hungry. This is a different kind of hungry. He, had, he has not eaten for 40 days. He was, if you're a southerner, he was hungry. Are you with me? He had lost some weight. He was physically tired. He was weak. It had been 40 days in the hot Judean wilderness, and he was at a physical low point. And here comes Satan. I want to present to you that often when you are stressed out, often when you are wore out, often when you are at your wit's end in the valley, there is both the hand of God that is reaching there for you and there's also the temptation of Satan that would want to push on you the most. Often when Sammy is stressed out and tired and hungry, often the best of Sammy doesn't always come out. But what about Jesus? What kind of Messiah will he be? And we see here as we look at the text, we see Jesus faced real temptation. Satan's goal, we look at Luke chapter 4, was to defeat the son. Satan's goal was to cause Jesus to sin, to cause Jesus to lose sense of why he is here, to cause Jesus to, to, to make himself not fit to be our sacrifice. Um, his goal was to defeat Jesus, and yet the reality of the reason that Jesus is here is to defeat Satan for its entire, his entirety. And so we see, well, how is Jesus going to act? And we see three temptations. I would present to you, these are the only temptations that Satan tempted Jesus for, but a sampling of how Satan was tempting Jesus. And so we see the first temptation, and in a sense, I would call the first temptation this. Satan wants Jesus to serve himself because God is not going to take care of you. And so Satan shows up at Jesus. The Bible says in verse 3, the devil says to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, if you've not eaten for 40 days, certainly bread would sound good to you. Satan's temptation to Jesus is more than just saying, use your divine powers for your own self. Satan, in a sense, is questioning God's goodness. He is questioning, will God really take care of you? Uh, he, the suggestion, perhaps, is you can just end your hunger pains. God's not going to provide for you. God's not going to take care of you. You're all alone. Just use your own... Just take care of yourself. And so the temptation, number one, is to serve yourself. God isn't going to take care of you. Satan ever whispered those things into your ears? Ever whispered things into your ears where you got to do what you got to do to take care of yourself? Ever whispered things in your ears that, that God's not there to help you? Ever whispered those lies that God's not going to keep his promises? Ever whispered uh, the, that deceit? That it's okay to excuse an action because you got to take care of yourself. Or whispered that, 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 that just outright lie that it's okay to be selfish. It's okay to, to do that action that you know is wrong. It's okay. Maybe he's ever Satan never tempted you. It's okay to lie. You know, it'd just be easier if you just if you just 
don't write the truth on your taxes. I mean, he ever tempted you to do what is wrong to serve yourself that God's not going to take care of you? That is where Satan is tempted Jesus. Notice how Jesus responds. Jesus responds by, by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. It is written, man must not live on bread alone but fried chicken. No, that's not what it says. Deuteronomy 8.3. Now, now, we only have half of Deuteronomy 8.3. The rest of it goes, man must not live on bread alone but on the... How's it go? But on the every word that comes from the mouth of God. In the original context, it was urging Israel to remain fixed on God's faithfulness, to stay focused on how God is faithful. And so here's Satan tempting Jesus. God's not going to take care of you. God's not good. And, and Jesus says, no, 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 no. Man doesn't need bread. I don't need to fill my belly. But I need to trust God's faithfulness. And we see, how is Jesus responding? He's not short-circuiting God's plan for his life. He's responding to the faithfulness of God. So we see another temptation come. And really the second temptation, in a sense, is to take the easy way out. It really is all this could be yours. And so Satan takes Jesus in a vision or, or maybe up into the heavens where he's able to see the known world, able to see Roman empire in all its glory. And, and so Jesus and Satan are looking over all of its glory. And, and so Satan offers them, here, you can, all this can be yours. You can be king over this vast empire. You can have all authority over all these kingdoms. I'll give it to you. All you have to do is worship me. Jesus takes them up on this offer. It's a way for Jesus to be king without the cross. He can be ruler without having to die and be humiliated and face all the pain and suffering. As ruler, Jesus could end the world of hunger. He could end the world of wars. He could set things right. And yet what Satan offers Jesus, a crossless alternative, doesn't fill the world of its basic need. Jesus was to take Satan up on this offer. He couldn't help the world with forgiveness. He could no longer be the Savior. If Jesus would bow down to Satan, in a sense, and worship him, Satan, he would be the servant of Satan. No longer would he serve God. And I want to present to you the offer that Satan presents is a lie. When Satan says, I'll give you all these kingdoms, he doesn't have all the kingdoms to give. He has influence, but all the world does not belong to Satan. It belongs to our, belongs to our great God. So he offers him a lie. He lies about what he offers, and he tries to get, to get Jesus to embrace the lie, to take an easy way out and say, all this can be yours. You ever been tempted by Satan to take an easy way? Maybe you're in college and you don't know the answer to the test, but that smart looking individual in front of you, you can see their answers? Huh. And take the easy way out? Probably the greatest temptation in our world today, in our day today, that I believe that Satan tempts people with today has to do with sex and pornography. And encouraging people to take an easy way out. With pornography, to, to feed lust. Not to be pure, not to honor God, but to, to feed lust. To, to not honor the marriage covenant, to not honor sexuality uh, and, and those issues with the way that God designed. But just to, just to, just to turn us into urges and, and just to turn us to doing our own, what we own feel right rather than what honors Jesus. I, I, I am... I'm afraid that Satan has too much victory over that issue with too many individuals. And we'll be tempted to take an easy way out rather than, to, than to, to live in holiness and live in a way that honors Jesus. And yet those easy ways never, never provide. They're, they're just like the offer here. The, those things, when we dishonor God's plan, we dishonor, don't do things God's way. It doesn't give joy and meaning. It only gives heartache and heartburn. Amen? How does Jesus respond to a crossless alternative, an easy way out? Verse 8, Jesus answered him, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus responds with a quote, Deuteronomy 8.3. It, it, it is, we are to worship God and serve God. God is worthy of my allegiance. Total allegiance to the Father. He doesn't short circuit God's plan, but, but, he, but he has a deep desire to want to honor God and pursue God. He says, no, I'm not going to take the easy way out. 
I'm going to worship God and serve him according to his plan for my life. So another temptation. Satan takes Jesus up to Jerusalem. He takes him to uh, the royal porch on the temple. And really this third temptation is almost a temptation. Prove it. Show me that you are indeed God's son. And he takes him to the high point in the, in the royal porch of Jerusalem temple. From that point down to the Kidron Valley is a 450 foot drop. Several people in, in Jewish day had jumped from there to their death. So there's Satan with Jesus, at a 400 foot drop, and says, all right, prove it. You say you're God's son, Satan then says, prove it. And he misquotes out of context Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. Sounds very spiritual, sounds very good, but it's out of context. It's not the heart of what God is saying. And so Jesus, prove it. If you are God's son, prove it. He won't... The Bible says angels will take care of you. You won't even stump your toe. Jump. See what happens. Now, it seems okay. But what it is is um, it is, it is unbelief masquering, masquerading as faith. And really, it is putting God to a test. It's unbelief rather than trusting God, trusting that God will take care of us. It's saying, show me. It's really pushing God to act. It's really unbelief. And it's a lie. It's a half-truth. Satan never whisper a half truce into your ear. There's an old saying in our culture that says this God takes care of those that help. Okay? God helps those that help. You've heard it before too. And it is not in Scripture, and it is not true. God doesn't help those that help themselves, God helps the weak. He helps the lowly. He helps those that can't help themselves. When we think we can help ourselves, we say, God, I got this. I can help myself. God says, all right, big boy, see how that works out for you. And when I am prideful, when I think I can help myself, it leads to, it leads to heartache and more heartburn. But when I come to God and say, God, I need you. I am desperate. I'm in over my head. God, please help me. There's where God says I can do something. There's another lie in our culture. Our media says it. Um, it sounds so tolerant. And the lie that it's a mistruth, it, it is an untruth, uh, it is not from Scripture. It's a lie that says something like this. Well, if you're sincere in whatever faith you choose, then you'll go to heaven. It's the idea that sincerity is all that matters. So if you're sincere in your faith, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're um, a Muslim, whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or whether you're an atheist or a Christian, it makes no difference as long as you are sincere in what you believe. And if you're a good little boy and a good little girl, then you'll get on God's list and you'll make it to heaven. And I want you to know that is a lie from the pits of hell. There are not multiple ways to get to heaven. There is one way to get to heaven. is through faith in Jesus. Jesus alone and Christ alone. Is the only way that we have any hope to have our sins forgiven. Here is a mis here's a mistruth, an untruth, misquoted. How would Jesus respond to Satan's temptation here? And Jesus again quotes scripture. Deuteronomy 6 16. It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. In the context, it was encouraging Israel, the nation, enters into the promised land to trust the Lord, not to test him as other generations have done. As we look at this text, we look at Luke chapter 4, I want us to notice what kind of God Christ is. Christ is the one with others have been tempted. tempted. We see in, in Genesis, the very first book, we see Adam and Eve, they're tempted by Satan in the garden, uh, there, and, and they fall. We see the nation of Israel. We see temptation, temptation, and they fall. We look in our own lives. We see temptations, and we fall. But what about Jesus? Where others have been tempted and they fall, Jesus is tempted, and he is faithful. Now, notice that. Many will make arguments, and they'll sit around coffee tables, and they'll say things like this. Well, Christ being God, fully God and fully man, were these temptations real? And if they were real, could Christ have actually sinned? All right, you eggheads. 
Let me answer that just real quickly. Here's what I believe. I believe that Christ was genuinely tempted. These are not false temptations. These are not examples. He was genuinely tempted. There was a temptation that he was genuinely tempted of by Satan. Secondly, I believe that Christ did not sin. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Here is the one that we sing to today. Here's the one that we worship to today. Here's the one that, that, that we follow today. He was tempted in every, in every way. If, if you are hurt today, if you are lonely today, if you are struggling today, Christ can sympathize with you. He understands hurt. He understands loneliness. He understands the struggle. And yet inside those hurts and struggles and heartaches and heart pains, Christ never once is disobedience, never once goes to anger. Christ never sins. He is our faithful. He shows us what a faithful human looks like. He shows us what a faithful follower looks like. He is faithful in every sense of faithfulness, in every sense of the word. He fulfills God's purpose for his life. So I want to chat with you a little bit about pursuing victory over temptation as we look at the great example of Jesus, who is faithful in the midst of temptations. You with me today, church? Three final things. We all face temptations. I want you to notice something about the scripture. We see that Christ is tempted. The temptation is not a sin. When you're tempted, it doesn't mean that you sin. It's a sin when you act on the temptation. But all of us face temptations. If you are here today and thinking that you've matured, that you have passed the point of temptations, but you have matured past that point, I hate to burst your bubble, but you haven't. I don't care if you've been a Christian for six weeks, six months, six years, or 60 years. I don't care if you're 6, 16, 26, or 666. We still face temptations. Now, the temptations might change. The temptations that I was tempted with at 18 is different than 40. But I want you to know there are still temptations from the Lord. Not from the Lord. Ooh. Temptations from Satan that still tempts us. And think about all the temptations that you and I may face in an ordinary day. Maybe you're tempted to stay in bed late. Temptation to laziness. Maybe to dress carelessly. The temptations to sloppiness or seductiveness. Maybe growling at the breakfast table, the temptation of being unkind to your family. Maybe arguing over who should change the, be- the baby this time, the temptation over selfishness. Maybe showing, starting at work 10 minutes late, the temptation of being slothful and stealing. Maybe losing your temp- temper when a coworker crashes your computer, the temptation to impatience and unkindness. Maybe flirting with a good looking woman. Or taking a second look at a good-looking man, the temptation to lust. Maybe refusing to speak to someone who hurts you, a, few, a temptation to harbor anger and unforgiveness. Maybe repeat a story you heard about your neighbor, the temptation to gossip. Maybe lying awake at night, thinking sensual thoughts, the temptation to impurity. Maybe taking out your anger on your children after a hard day, a temptation to cruelty. Maybe going out to eat when you can't afford it, the temptation to self-indulgence. Maybe having a second or third helping of fried chicken. Temptation to gluttony. Maybe sending out a nasty text or email to someone who's hurt you. The temptation to revenge. And we face a whole lot of temptations. We're not immune to them. We don't graduate from the school of temptation. Satan continues to tempt us. I noticed something in the text. Verse 13, after the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. That last time that Satan tempted Jesus. As we want to achieve victory, as we want to honor God in the midst of temptations, as we want to pursue God through temptations, I believe that Scripture is the best weapon against temptation. Notice every time Satan tempts Jesus, Jesus responds by quoting a passage in Deuteronomy. He responds by quoting Scripture. I love what Psalms 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I believe one of the greatest ways for you to withstand the temptations of Satan is for you to make sure you put God's word in your heart. As you read God's word, as you study God's word, as you memorize God's word, it becomes a sword in which you push back the enemy. Maybe today you want to start by 
memorizing some verses. A great verse to start maybe Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I find that both scripture reading, scripture studying with others, and scripture memorization, those are all hard disciplines. But when you set your mind to it with accountability and help from others, it does help you in the fight against sin. And then third, is the truth that we don't have to give in to temptation. Christ is our great example. He shows us that though we are tempted, we don't have to succumb to temptation. We don't have to answer the temptations. We don't have to, we don't have to fall into that slimy pit, but we, we do not have to give in to temptations. The Bible says in Hebrew, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, this, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but when the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, according to God's word, the Bible says that, Christian, when you are tempted to sin, when you're enticed to sin, when you're enticed to, to say no to God and yes to selfishness and sin, the Bible says that there is a way out, that God gives an escape hatch, that God gives an exit door, that we're to look for that. God, God, here's the temptation, but God, where is my way out? Where is my escape? Where is my exit door for me to honor you and not honor myself or dishonor you? God says, you don't have to succumb to that, but, but we all face it. It's common to man, but God is faithful to help us in the midst of it. One of the great ways, I believe, to not give in temptation is, is found in James 4, 7. Therefore, the Bible says, submit to God, but resist the devil. He will flee to you. And I think church, friends, there's a close cor coronation between the closer you draw to God, the easier it is to resist temptation. When your heart is pursuing Jesus, when your life is desiring to follow after Jesus, I think that you can recognize temptation for what it is. But when you let your heart go sideways, when you aren't making steps toward Jesus, but you're doing whatever feels right or seems right, I think that's when temptation and the Satan, your most vulnerable, your most, you struggle probably the most with temptation. Greatest victory over temptation. You don't have to succumb to temptation. I think it's closely tied to you pursuing Jesus, submitting to his will over your life. See, temptation gets its power. By persuading us that we'll be happier if we follow the temptation than, than if we follow Jesus. Think about it. What does Satan offer? Satan says, Jesus, you'll be happier if you have food rather than trust God. You'll be happier if you have all these kingdoms rather than have the cross. You'll be happier if you, if, if you prove that you are God's son by jumping rather than leaving it to wonder. He is, all the temptations were saying you'll be happier if you'll do this. Rather than trust God and hear me, you are never happier. You are never have more peace. You're never more content when you say no to God. You are only find peace and comfort and joy when you say yes to King Jesus. There's an old Indian folklore story. I doubt this is true, but it makes for a good closing point to a sermon. So hold on. An old Indian folklore story that often for young Indians, brave, little in, brave Indians, when they would cross over from boyhood to manhood, they would go off by themselves and be alone and, and so they could, they could make it by themselves alone. So this young Indian warrior, he went off to a luscious valley and trees and had water, everything was good. And there he was fasting for, for multiple days and he looked up from the valley and saw a snow covered mountain and said, you know what? I want to prove that I can make it, that snow cover. I'm going to hike up there. So he took a blanket, he took an old, he took a, a bear skin and wrapped it around him and he began to make provisions to travel the top of the peak of the snow covered mountain. And so after many days, he, he got to the peak of the mountain. And he looked over the vast, he could see for forever, see for miles. And he thought in his heart, woohoo! I'm not sure Indians think that, but maybe they, they thought that. Saw everything. This brave Indian warrior was so happy he could see. And then as he was celebrating at the top of the peak, he heard a rustling at his feet. And it was a snake. The snake spoke to him. The snake said, 
I'm about to die. It's too cold for me. I'm starving to death. I can't get food up here on this mountain. Will you just put me in your coat and carry me back down the valley so I can live? And the young Indian warrior looked at him and said, no, no, no. I've heard about you. I've been warned about you. I'm not coming close to you. If I do, you will bite me and I will die. And the snake looks at him and says, ah, you're not going to die. I won't do that to you this time. I'm, I'm about to die. If you'll just help me, it'll be okay. I won't treat you like that. And, and so the exchange went. So finally the Indian warrior succumbed to the snake's conversation and picks up the snake, tucks him inside his shirt, goes back down the mountain. He gets back to the warmer climate, to the valley. He takes the snake out of his shirt puts him back down in the grass, and as soon as he does, the snake coils up, the rattle starts rattling, and the snake bites him on his leg. You promised! The snake looks back up the Indian warrior and says, you knew what I was when you picked me up. Hear me, church. Nothing breaks our God's heart more Nothing breaks your pastor's heart more than when we fall to temptation and we sin. There's been too much of that going on in our culture today where people ignoring God's plan, ignoring holiness, ignoring God's desire for their life. Too much not just in our culture, there's too much inside God's church and we think, well, it'll just be okay. It, it'll be okay just this once. We want to make excuse for doing things our way. Excuse for not trusting God. Excuse for not holding on to God's promises. Excuse for, for why it's okay to do it our way rather than God's way. And I want you to hear, every time we step away from God and His plan, it only leads us to being snake bit. Here's good news. Here's hope. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, if you fall into temptation, if you found yourself bitten by Satan's lies and snakes, there's still hope. If you ask God to forgive you, if you ask God to help you, he will. And today, may God open our eyes to the temptation and snakes and lies around us. And may we, may we shield Satan with the sword of the, the word. And may we submit anew and afresh to God's desire for our life. Will you pursue Jesus? Will you pursue Jesus? Let's pray. Dearly Father, God, we thank you for Jesus being our example, being our savior, being perfect in every way. Now we pray in this holy moment that you would help us to treasure what a Savior that we have who understands our hurts, who understands our problems, who understands our temptations and can help us. So God, would you help us? God, I pray in this holy moment, Father, that in a way that only you can, that your Spirit, Lord, would show us, disclose to us the way that Satan tempts us. God, I mean, we see clearly, like we've never seen before, Satan's temptations his enticements. May we see it as sin and may we not embrace a lie. Father, if where we have sinned and whether we have fallen from you, will you forgive us? Father, will you help us to see that we need you? Will you help us to see our need for a Savior? Maybe you're here today as we talk about sin. You recognize that you have sinned. You recognize that you need a Savior. Maybe today you recognize that Jesus is the only one that can save you. If maybe in the day, in the quiet of the moment, you want to ask Christ to be your Savior to save you. If so, will you do that? There's no magic words to pray, but that's a reflection of your heart. We just ask Christ, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying for me. Will you save me? God will hear that heart and he'll save you. God, will you help us to... To look to you and to look to your grace. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, as we come to our invitation time, we invite you to respond to God's desire for your life. Maybe today you want to sing to the Lord as your pledge to surrender to Him afresh and new. If so, in a second, sing. Maybe today you recognize, man, I've not honored Jesus. I need help. I need God's guidance. I need God to move in an area of my life or in I need God to move in my family's life. I invite people to come to the altar and pray and ask for God's help and guidance in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. And you want to join our church. We'd love for you to be part of our, your, our family here. The second, when we stand, we'd love for you just to walk down the aisle and say, Pastor, I want to be part of God's family here. We'd love for you to do that. Or maybe today you recognize your need to be saved. Maybe you just prayed for Christ to save you or just recently prayed that way. We'd love for you to come make it public. I'd love you to walk down the aisle and say, Pastor, I ask Christ to save me. We won't embarrass you. We want to celebrate with you. Have our counselor talk with you about next steps. As God moves in your heart, will you respond to King Jesus? As we stand together and sing, you come. You honor the Lord. your heads with me continue to pray as we continue to respond to the Lord listen to a song sung do you have needs do you have worries are you heavy laden are you tempted take it to God in prayer where in your life do you just need to say God help God I need you God helps those not who help themselves but God helps those who are weak who are lowly who are dependent upon him. Where do you say, God, I need you in my area of my life? God, may you hear the cries of your people. God, you are a strong God. You are a good God. There is no God like you. So God, we, for your glory, for your, for your honor, Will you move? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, it's been a great joy to worship with you this morning. So glad that you're here. If you're new here, we'd love for you to stop by our welcome desk on your way out. We'd love to give you a gift from our church, information about our church as well. I'd love for you to come back out tonight for our evening service as well, as we have a baptism uh, tonight. Um, well, I will have two pastors. Pastor Michael and Pastor Eric will be here at the front when the service is over. Uh, if you have something you'd like to pray about or something you'd like to talk to a pastor about, they'd love to chat with you about anything, and they'll be, they'll be down front ready to chat with you in any way at all. Um, may God just bless you. It's been a great way. I've loved worshiping with you today. We're going to close our service singing one final song, and this will be the closing.